So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fung, again for this informative lecture. And now we start taking questions. I'll start by giving you two questions uh, till I get the questions from the audience here. Mm -hmm. So um, if you really think it's of a very specific subtype uh, when you're reading a case, would you actually communicate this somehow to the physician? Yes, I, I include that in my impression. And we go over almost all of these in our tumor board. And um, I, I will tell them what it is. And sometimes they wonder whether or not it, the lesion needs to be biopsied. And I kind of say no, because I'm very confident in my, uh, in my assessment. But, you know, part of it is, you know, whether or not they're, you know, what the other risk factors that the patient has is, you know, and, and, and what kind of surgical candidate they are. So. Okay, great. Thank you. The other, my second question is, what about the incidence in male? Would this um, reflect certain subtype? Or would this refer to certain subtype? in your uh, okay. opinion and what's the incidence of malignant transformation in such case so i i guess i don't have the specific um incidence for males off the top of my head um, but because the beta cadenine uh, subtypes are more common in male and those are the highest malignant risk uh, then that's why they um they are recommended to be resected Okay, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Fung. So I have questions now. Uh, uh, two questions from our friend from Argentina, Diego, Diego Heberman. Is it correct to say Diego or Diego? Wherever you, you correct me, please. No, Die Diego is correct. Diego, okay, good, good. So Diego, uh, would uh, you like to give the questions, please? Yes, of course. Uh, the first question is, why do you think that the, the guidelines from the European Association do not uh, recommend observations uh, regardless size in HNF uh, alpha-1 adenomas, concerning that MRI is very confident uh, to categorize that subtype and there's no risk uh, of malignancy? Yeah. I know you have uh, uh, understand the, the, the intention of the question. So I think you're asking me, um, why why ESOL recommends uh, resecting an adenoma an HNF1 adenoma that is greater than five centimeters? Exactly. Okay. Um, you know, I actually that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I wonder if it has more to do with even though they do have a low uh, bleeding risk of more so of the bleeding risk and um, yeah. Because I think talking to my pathology friends, uh, it's very, very rare uh, to have malignant transformation uh, for these types of HNF1 alphas. Okay, okay. And, and the second one, uh, perhaps you have uh, mentioned in your presentation and I missed, but I'd like to know if you can provide some clues to differentiate the uh, galocetic acid uh, enhancement in, in the patobiliar phase from beta catenin adenomas from the typical enhancement of the four-colonator hyperplasia. Uh, concerning that in my country, the first or uh, the prior indication for uh, patobiliar adhesions is to differentiate uh, these two benign tumors. No? Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, I think I think the way I would approach it is. Number one, what does it look like on every other sequence? Um, you know, is the T2 hyper intensity, is it very T2 hyper intense? Or is it relatively ISO intense to the background liver? So if it's relatively ISO intense to the background liver, then I would think that this is more of an F and H. You know, what does it look like on, you know, T1? Is it relatively ISO intense to the background liver? Then I would think more F and H. As far as, you know, uh, on the hepatobiliary phase, I think, you know, I think FNHs do have an internal kind of internal architecture. Uh, and the examples that I've seen, there's not very, uh, there's, there's not a very good internal architecture from what I've seen. And so I think that's where I would base it on. 
and then you know if it needs to be biopsied it should be biopsied okay thank you very much thank you uh second question from sana sana would you want to give the question please Assalamu uh, alaikum. Uh, I would like to ask about the, the role of diffusion imaging in characterization of adenomas from hepatocellular carcinoma. You know, I, you know, so, you know, they can they can both show uh, positive diffusion, uh, restricted diffusion. So I don't know if it's if it really differentiates the two entities. Okay, um, Dr. Canella, Buonasera, Dr. Canella, you have a question. Roberto. Buonasera, and thank you for the very nice presentation. The question is, um, which is your approach uh, on in patient with multiple hepatocellular adenoma for biopsy? Do you biopsy a single lesion, multiple lesion, the largest? Yeah, um, that's a great question because uh, Sometimes, yeah, you have really large lesions that look very complex, and which of them do you go for? Um, I go for the one that does not have uh, similar characteristics to the others. Uh, so I'll I'll go for, you know, the one that looks the most worrisome, that may have the most atypical characteristics, and then. You know, if they all kind of look atypical, then I'll I'll just biopsy the representative one. I'll also uh, look at the look at the largest one. So sometimes there have been times when I've biopsied like two in one patient. Did this answer your question, Dr. Canelo? Yes, thank you. It's very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other question from the audience? Uh, what uh, the doctor, uh, uh, Doctor Fung, did you uh, experience seeing uh, like um, the lesions with uh, the the uh, arterial phase hyper enhancement and washout with enhancing capsule and non serotic liver? Again, how would you handle this, especially that Lyraz will not apply to uh, the non serotic liver? Except sure. Um, B. Yeah, so on on these, I think we would uh, we would say that it I would I would call it a you know a suspicious lesion, and I would recommending recommend biopsying it or following it at the very least. Okay. Um, doctor, I have a question for the uh, Dr. Serlin or Dr. Cherniak or both of them or Dr. Cherniak and Dr. Serlin. Uh, I, what's the status of including uh, the benign uh, entities or benign pathologists uh, in non serotic liver in LIRADS or? I mean, we get this question a lot, so I appreciate if you can elaborate on that. Victoria, uh, do you want to answer that? I missed the first part. Did you ask what the downside or I, the, the, you oh. cut out the very first part? Or what I is think, the status? I, well, uh, I, I can answer then, Victoria, because for, for whatever, he didn't cut out for me, so maybe there's some, anyway, my internet, I was able to hear uh, uh, Khaled. What he was asking is the following, uh, what is the status of including or providing some educational material or guidance material on benign liver lesions uh, by LIRADS? Um, and so, Khaled, the answer to your question is that a couple of years ago, we convened a working group within LIRADS uh, called the Benign Liver Lesion uh, Working Group. Uh, this working group is, is led by Maxime Renault, who is a radiologist uh, in France. Uh, he's a real expert uh, in benign liver lesions, and he's leading the effort. Uh, we're hoping to have some material uh, released on benign liver lesions in the next uh, couple years. Uh, we'll probably focus on 
things that are not quite as complicated as adenomas. Um, we'll probably focus on things such as, uh, you know, quote unquote, hemangiomas and cysts and focal fat deposition. Uh, but eventually we will need to tackle hepatocellular adenomas and uh, it'd be great to get, uh, you know, Dr. Fung to, to contribute to that. So, Alice, I don't know if you're currently a member or not of this benign liver lesion working group, but uh, maybe we can discuss offline about whether you'd be interested in contributing to that, you know, in the years to follow. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank um, you. I'd like to add to that. Um, it, so, right now in the LIRADS manual, there is a chapter on benign uh, lesions. Um, now, they are pertaining to cirrhosis, but, you know, of course, there's a significant overlay. So there, there's some information that's already available um, should you want to consult the uh, manual, which is for free on ACR site. Yeah. Thank you, Victoria, for clarifying. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I have a question, uh, Alice, for you. Do you. Kala, do you mind if I ask a question? I usually mind, but now I am in good mood, so please go ahead and <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad you're in a good mood. Uh, um, Alice, first of all, that was a terrific lecture. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge. I really appreciate it. Um, in your, I, I don't believe you covered this uh, in detail in your lecture. If, if I did, then I missed it. I apologize. But did you run across anything, uh, either in your own experience or in preparing for this lecture, uh, about uh, adenomas associated with uh, alcoholic liver disease um, and how those adenomas look and what the best approach is for those. So sorry, it's kind of a combined question, but my question is about adenomas in the setting of alcoholic liver disease. Um, yeah, I did, I did see a little bit written about it, um, being that uh, that there is there could be an increased risk for adenomas in alcohol use or abuse and possibly some adenomas in cirrhotic patients but i think um but i think there's still a lot to be learned in that area and especially since i think it's really hard to call something an adenoma in a cirrhotic patient so i don't know am i answering your question no, no, you, you, you are. Uh, um, my, the concern, I have a theoretical concern, which is that in patients with alcoholic cirrhosis, um, do these patients ever have adenomas uh, that um, are benign, uh, but that actually have arterial phase hyperenhancement and washed out appearance, and therefore would be uh, categorized as LIRADS5 uh, inappropriately? Um, it's a theoretical concern. I, I don't have any real data at this point. I don't know whether you've run across that problem. Do you have any experience with that of, of miscategorizing uh, benign adenomas in the setting of cirrhosis as LIRAD5? Or is this, in your experience, an extremely rare uh, problem uh, and we shouldn't be too worried about it at this point? Well, I just, I guess since we, the algorithm does not include biopsy, I don't know how we could really be sure uh, whether or not we're actually treating an adenoma or not. Um, so I think that I think it might be really hard to study. Yeah. Um, does anyone else that's listening in have any experience on this issue? No. Well, if not, no. one thing. Uh, so. I, I, one other, so this is not a question, this is just going to be a comment. Um, so Khaled, when you first started this uh, liver series, one of the themes that you mentioned is that, you know, we need uh, international collaboration and, and that this liver webinar is sort of, in, in a way, a way of communicating, you know, across con countries and continents, at least among those of us who are, um, you know, um, dialing in to, to these uh, liver lectures. Um, it occurs to me that, and the reason I'm bringing this up, is that it occurs to me that some of the questions that have been asked today, as well as for other lectures, are very insightful. Uh, so some of the questions about how to differentiate um, um, uh, beta-catenin uh, mutated adenomas that have hepatocellular uh, uptake 
uh, versus focal nodular hyperplasias. And, and I think that some of these questions uh, can really only be answered through um, a multi-institutional and possibly even an international uh, collaborative consortium uh, because probably no one institution will have enough cases uh, to study this question. And I think it'd be really interesting if, you know, Khaled within our group here, you know, by our group, I mean the people that are routinely calling into your liver webinar, could we create uh, some sort of consortium um, to um, look at this sort of case where we, you know, we, we could identify every case of a beta-catenin mutated adenoma that underwent uh, gadozetate MRI. Uh, and maybe some people will have two cases and some people will have one and some people will have three. Uh, but if, if 30 of us participate, between the 30 of us, we might end up with 50, 60, 70, 80 cases, and then see whether or not we can, in fact, differentiate these adenomas from FNH by, uh, by testing certain hypotheses, such as those that Alice mentioned. You know, Alice uh, uh, hypothesized that the texture of the hepatobiliary phase and the other imaging features might be um, uh, discriminators. Um, well, these are hypotheses that we could potentially test if we were to get it you know, a database of, you know, 50, 60, 70 cases, which, again, I don't think any one center can do. I think it will require uh, a multi-center, possibly multi-nation uh, collaboration. Anyway, it's just a comment. No, 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 uh, that's great, but... actually. This is great. I actually already um, trying to uh, collect these data, and we have also a lot of cases in media, not just, uh, I think we have, we can actually contribute with a large number of cases from MD Anderson. So, so that, that would be a great thing to, to do together as multi-center um, investigative, like retrospective research. Yeah. You can get. So, yeah. Yeah. So one thing, Khaled, maybe one thing you can do is you can, uh, you can ask the people that are participating in this webinar to mm -hmm indicate to you by email uh, or some other mechanism if it's if email is not the right mechanism whether they would potentially be interested in in uh, um, joining in some sort of um, multidisciplinary multi-institutional collaborative research effort sure. um, and I could see both uh, you know some of this could be educational and some of this could be research absolutely absolutely and there are several questions uh, to be investigated in hepatocellular adenomas so we can we can look into that for sure that's a great. <clears throat> yeah. So um, uh, I see no more questions. Uh, Daniela Segura is telling us I'm in, of course. Thank you very much for being in. Uh, and it will be a great. Uh, Roberto Canella also from Italy. So that that's a, that's a great thing to have this multi-center collaboration, Doctor. Sirlin, this is a great idea. Let's look into the yeah. questions and the educational questions to be looked at, and we can accumulate these data. And yeah, I'm telling you that we have a big number of of, uh, of cases. The questions that came to my mind to, to ask Dr. Fong was based on uh, cases that we have seen in the end. So, like for example, increased incidence in adenomas in males, for example because what uh, Alice mentioned about uh, the incidence of beta-catenin in males. So all of these questions are real cases that we have seen in the tumor boards, and they come all the time to M.D. Anderson. And it's problematic, uh, you know, as, as Alice mentioned, because even the histopathology can be really confusing, right? So uh, with that, I don't see any further questions, and unless anyone wants to add any comment or question, mm -hmm. I would. Uh, does anyone have any question or comment before I conclude? No. Okay, great. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much, Dr. Fung, for the informative, practical, and terrific lecture that you've given today. And tomorrow, we have the lectures we've been waiting for. I hope we, all, we were going to be all there to uh, uh, listen to a magnificent lecture by Dr. Michelle Mandrata Lala. She's going to talk about post leukoregional treatment response, uh, imaging of uh, post leukoregional treatment response. So um, I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks again, Alice. Thank you. This was my pleasure and my honor. Thank you. Thank you very much.